The impression that people get of him is a guy who's got it made. He's really got it made. He has problems the same as everybody else, except Blake, I think, conceals his. I think he really likes uh, being alive. If he's depressed, maybe it's because he feels he's not doing enough, you know, like he feels maybe he's wasting his time working. Like people say, what do you do? Oh, I just fly around, you know, and I need the money, I work. Nobody said a man's got to work. A guy like that, just moving into a scene and, and out of it, turns on people, you know, like uh, you see him and you say, God, he's free, he's free, and uh, I should be like that. thing is, it's so hard to be free now. Roads are jammed, the stores are jammed, the cities are jammed. Blake hates cities. Blake won't go anywhere near a city unless he has to. Blake's idea is what you don't spend, you don't have to earn. And that, that's why he drives these terrible beat up old cars. When I first heard about Blake, I heard about him years before I met him. I said, oh yeah, he sounds like some phony, you know, some kind of nut that sort of lives up in the, in the woods to entice young girls to come up there and stay with him. Because it was a young girl that told me about him. You know? She described this uh, man who lived in the woods and he was sweet and gentle, very innocent, almost naive, childlike, you know, all these things that uh, you say, oh yeah, yeah, sure. Anyway, when I met the guy, he, you know, he's, I get the feeling that he's a real person. He can't stand to be tied down. And this is why he gets so mad at himself when he collects all this junk. So what he does now really is he just locks the door and pays his rent in advance and heads out. Uh, you know, these cross-country trips can turn out to be anywhere from a day. You know, the engine might pack up the first day or it might hold out for a couple of weeks until he gets as far as Edmonton. The last, uh, let's see, the second last cross-country trip he went on, he was away two years. Blake was born in the wrong age, you know. All his heroes are the First World War fighter pilots, you know. He's always talking about the First World War, you know, Bishop Barker, Collishaw, and uh, this is when Blake really comes alive. There's a thousand and one drawings that he's got up on his wall of his aeroplane. 
in British markings, you know, in French markings, and uh, with little um, crosses all down the fuselage. Some of the hairiest experiences he's had are, are to be caught up after dark because he loses himself and forgets about time. Yeah, but uh, I, I don't think he's taken night flying, has he? I don't think he's even qualified to fly at night. Oh, gosh, no. His, his airplane uh, just isn't uh, equipped for night flying, no navigation or anything like that. No lights, no radio. He's not a daredevil type of fellow. And uh, so he's so sincere in thinking he's doing everything so safe. Even his unique uh, methods of uh, navigating, such as falling roads, and which is fine until they fork, and then you got problems. Does he ever use a parachute? No. He'd never bail out. For him, the idea of leaving his airplane is absolutely unthinkable. He'd put it into the trees or into a lake first. Seven Roger, you're 30 miles east of the airport. Transpond 04 Alpha and contact Montreal Arrival Control to frequency 119.3. Don't know, sir. Can't raise him. Air Canada He's just coming in anyway. Must be in trouble. Uh, this was ridiculous. You can't just come in here like that. Let's get going down there to check him out.
Uh, Canada 307, uh, you're three miles northeast of Roxton. Have you left 12,000 yet? Come on, get it up, boy. Get it up, boy. Jeez. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you.
kids find him fascinating. The way he dresses and the way he's so different. And not trying to be different, but he just is. The thing that I think that people respond to him in is that he's, he's, you know that he's not going to hurt you. You don't have to be on your guard. I often envy his, uh, this real sense of freedom that he has that we would all like. But what I am not willing to do is give up what I've got in, in married life and my children. I wonder if he re ever regrets not getting married or if he ever will I marry. I often wonder why, why he doesn't, because he's got lots of girlfriends. So. Yeah, all of a sudden, it's like saying, you know, he should have a steady job. Why should a guy get married? You know? I remember he had one girlfriend out in uh, Banff. Uh, this is a very personal thing, but I, I think that he was really interested in her. And you know that that girl was nuts about him, and she couldn't bring herself to introduce him to her parents. Because he's such a character, or such an individual, such a... I mean, I, she evidently came from a very staid family, and she couldn't bring herself to do it, to finally, yeah, well, they called it off. I wonder if sometimes he doesn't sit back and wonder where he's going, what he's doing, um, whether he's getting anywhere. He's just being... Uh what he wants to be. You feel that there's a man that's doing, when he wants to do something, he can do it. You know, it just makes you want to feel that I'm going to get in that position, in my way. He just happens to be a, a freer than, than most of us. talks very casually about some of the problems he's had with his plane that uh, it almost sounds as if he was uh, he was fearless you know until um, the time when he took off on one of his Edmonton trips and uh, he got in the cockpit and, and you could see obviously that there is a fear that uh, I had never seen in Blake before and then he, as he took off you see that, that plane bounce down the down the field and then sort of wobble up and uh, it's just almost nostalgic to see this fellow going off into the into the sunset, and uh, almost though we were saying goodbye to him, and and we we really felt we'd never see him again.